So good morning. Uh, welcome back. Uh, after yesterday's extravaganza, uh, we have more to go um, until midday tomorrow. And um, I know that there are a lot of, we, we actually have some classes on Fridays at the law school, um, and it's the first year students who have class. Uh, so I know that a lot of them are coming in and out during the day, um, and, uh, but are eager to be at a, as many of the sessions as possible. Um, so uh, I'm Karen Engel, and I teach here at the law school and co-direct the Rappaport Center. Um, and uh, the panel this morning that we're starting with, um, or I should say the round table, because really we're gonna have a discussion um, among each other, so there aren't going to be long presentations. It'll be a series of sort of short responses to questions and engagement with each other. Um, but it is entitled Beyond Double Standards, and there's a description in the program, but I think um, it'll become clear what we're hoping to talk about as we, as we move through the discussion. Um, and I'll just start by saying, I, I, I said yesterday in the opening, but I know everyone wasn't there, um, that this is the first conference we're pretty sure to bring together self-consciously um, human rights and prison abolition. And so we thought that it would be good to start with this panel um, with two people who have worked quite a bit and worked quite a bit in international human rights field and international criminal law, um, and then one person who works a lot on policing. Um, we had a second person, um, well, I should say a fourth person for the panel, um, who unfortunately was not able to be here, uh, Tanjiwi Makaris. Um, she had a personal emergency at the, at the last minute, and I, her contributions, um, would be very important um, because she does work a lot with the movement for black lives. So we'll try to bring some of that into the discussion, but welcome. There'll be a lot of time um, for you all to chime in as well. Um, so uh, I also mentioned that part of our interest in bringing together human rights and prison abolition um, quite self-consciously was because of the concern that a number of us have had about the turn to criminal law um, by the international human rights movement, um, the turn to international criminal law on one hand, but also to investigating, prosecuting, and punish um, being the main remedy that a lot of um, human rights um, regional courts in particular, but um, make as the remedy. So states need to, in response to human rights violations, um, investigate, prosecute, and punish. Um, and I'll just say, because she's smiling, um, but uh, Zena Miller and I, um, along with Dennis Davis, co-edited a book um, called Anti-Impunity and the Human Rights Agenda a few years ago. You'll hear a little bit about Vasuki's chapter in that book. Um, and so what I was saying yesterday, we sort of got to that point and then thought, okay, what next? And a lot of what we wanna start doing is the what next, um, while also trying to point to some of what we gain um, from the human rights lens or, or lenses in the ways in which they've been used. Um, but, uh, but one of our frustrations, I guess, is that um, one of the major critiques, to the extent that, so there are folks who are critical of the turn to criminal law, but not really, it's the way in which it turns. So it's often, why is the international criminal court focused on Africa, <coughs> or state actors and non-state actors from Africa, but not from the United States, for example. Um, and similarly, um, or, or maybe even the human rights movement successfully pushed for the prosecution, if not ultimately the end of a trial with Pinochet, but not with Kissinger. So that's a double standards kind of argument that gets made a lot, and we think it's important, and so one of the things we wanna do here is explore sort of what we get from calling attention to that double standard, but also think about where we could go um, beyond, how we could go beyond that, um, particularly through a more abolitionist lens. Um, and similarly, at the domestic level, it seems that when attention is finally given to police brutality, it's often at the moment, so I should say mainstream attention, it's often at the moment that a police officer um, who has killed an African-American man, usually that's what gets the attention, um, and is not indicted um, or is acquitted. And so some people, the mainstream media often couch that as, well, what should we do? We need to go and do to them what 
they do to everyone else, and we need to prosecute them um, and punish them. So Kate's been working, Kate Levine has been working a lot on that, and um, so that's, that's sort of the double standard in that context we want to think about as well. Um, so I think one of the animating ideas um, for this morning is how might the human rights movement return to some of its earlier roots of trying to get people out of prison? So I mentioned yesterday, that's what Amnesty International formed to do, um, although it was mostly focused on political prisoners. So how and, and might we expand that focus? Um, and um, what, would that, what would that larger vision look like? Um, so we have a great group of folks to discuss that. Um, I already mentioned um, that Tenjui uh, McCarris will not be here, um, but I'm gonna quote from her at one point, um, and then I'll tell you the people who are here. So Jamil Dakwar is director of the American Civil Liberty Union's Human Rights Program, um, where he leads a team of lawyers and researchers that advise all the ACLU programs on international human rights law. Um, and he also oversees the ACLU's human rights documentation, um, as well as advocacy and litigation before international and regional human rights bodies. Um, Jamail began his human rights career law, law career in Israel as a lawyer for Adala, the legal center for Arab minority rights in Israel. And then he went, to work on, he went on to work for Human Rights Watch for how many years? Oh, it, nearly two years. Okay, for, a couple, for two years, um, where he primarily worked on issues of torture and detention um, in Egypt, Morocco, Israel, and the occupied Palestine, uh, Palestinian territory. Um, and he's been here before, and it's great to have him back. Um, and obviously, uh, we'll, well, I'll, I'll let him tell you about his work as we move forward. Um, Kate Levine, who I already mentioned, is a law professor at Cardozo School of Law at um, Yeshiva University. Um, her research and teaching interests focus on criminal law, criminal procedure, policing, evidence, and the legal ethics of criminal lawyering. Um, she has written a number of law review articles about the ways in which police are and are not disciplined. Um, and she's currently working on a piece that argues, using an abolitionist lens, that to increase the harshness, and these are her, her, this is her language, to increase the harshness of the criminal legal system against police officers will, far from its proponent's goal, legitimize and increase the footprint of our current criminal legal system. Um, Vasuki Nasaya, um, who I also mentioned um, as writing the chapter in the book, um, is an international legal scholar who worked for many years at the International Center for Transitional Justice and is now a professor at the Gallatin School at NYU. And this is about her 10th time to be on. We put you on a different stage this time, <laughs> um, but Masuki is a regular visitor, fortunately for us. Um, she is a founding member of Third World Approaches to International Law, and this is a test of the audience. How do you, what's the acronym? Yeah. <laughs> um, and has published widely on the history and politics of human rights, humanitarianism, international criminal law, international feminisms, and colonial legal history, uh, with a particular focus on transitional justice and reparations. Um, and even though she didn't realize it until very recently, um, she did largely inspire the idea of this panel um, with the <laughs> chapter that she wrote um, called Doing History with Impunity, um, and I'll let her tell you more about that. So, I'm gonna begin with um, a question for each person that will allow them to tell you a little bit about their work and in relationship to double standards um, and the arguments about double standards. So I thought it'd be good to start at the beginning to just ask when and how do you find, when do you make the double standards argument? When and how do you find it useful? Um, what is the power, the power of pointing out that hegemons and police are rarely held criminally accountable, um, even though they pursue criminal punishment of others. Um, so each, feel free to talk for four or five minutes about your work and when and how you use or find the double standards argument to be useful. Um, we'll start with Jamil. Uh, sure, um, thanks Karen, and I'm really happy to be back here. Uh, what a great uh, conference, and uh, yesterday was really uh, incredible start of uh, conversation about that, and, and um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to also 
um, listening to and learning more. Uh, as I come from the human rights uh, kind of movement, uh, I, I must say that, you know, I was, I was listening yesterday and I was like looking through the, the program. Um, I think that's really great to have uh, that conversation because I think a lot of times uh, the different movements are operating in, in silos and I think one of the things we uh, we, we forget that what the human rights, uh, not the movement necessarily, or the, the groups that ad adopt the human rights framework or in the, you know, from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and all the, the other uh, instruments and other values and ideals, but uh, just the, the f you know, the framework itself. We, ha we really f forget that it really is about a document or a, a series of agreements that have been made by governments, that have been made after uh, extensive compromises, uh, that have already in, included in those documents uh, different articles that give a lot of flexibility to states on how to, to protect and, and defend human rights, uh, respect human rights. And a lot of that is sometimes uh, uh, comes at the expense of really thinking bigger and making it challenge us to think outside that framework. And I think that's sometimes the, the challenge for us is that while it is been, it has been an incredible uh, framework for a lot of um, uh, social justice movement, I think that in, in some aspects of it, it would be uh, sometimes restricting or limiting. So we have to be also critical of that and to see, and in fact, in, the, in recent years, We've even seen some very conservative organizations um, using the same framework to push for their own uh, uh, agenda that is really an, essentially an anti-human rights agenda. Uh, whether in the context of the right to life, of the unborn, uh, at the UN level, whether it's on the, uh, the NRA coming out also in the context of the right to, to life and pushing for uh, what they believe is their right to, to, to bear arms and, and pushing it at the international agenda, whether it's the uh, uh, settlers uh, in, in, in the West Bank uh, making arguments about uh, the way that they have also their own human rights within that settler um, colonial regime, etc. And there are a lot of other examples. Uh, what I think that was, for me, at least for the work that we do, the most important thing for using the human rights framework is that it really, for challenging the United States where it is or where it has been over the years and, and in the United States' role historically in challenging, uh, uh, in challenging the U.S. Uh, basically taking uh, different approaches towards human rights. First of all, there's, there's a disconnect between domestic and international. Uh, and if there will be a use of human rights, it will be for the purposes of our foreign policy. And we would not really serious about that because this will also be compromised. So when we have certain friends and allies, we will turn a blind eye. And so for us, it was, okay, what, what does that mean for uh, a national a domestic organization like the ACLU that has only in, uh, a domestic mandate, historically, We're, we'll be celebrating 100 years next year, that has consistently focused on protecting the rights of people here in the United States or been I impacted by United States uh, government actions, but we don't have a mandate to work on other governments. So for us, the double standards framework, just in general terms, has been how do we really challenge U.S. Uh, hypocrisy and double standard in the way that it has been implemented or lack of implementation or disregard to what's happening in the U.S. and and with showing some examples of how it has been selectively picking and choosing where human rights would be enforced internationally. Now I, I always go back and that is really our guiding star to, um, to the examples that, uh, of the uh, D.E.W.D. Bois, uh, 1947 petition to the United Nations, uh, which has been an, a, a, really a shift 
in the struggle against Jim Crow and segregation in the United States, particularly in the way that international advocacy, international, international uh, engagement was utilized in order to shame the United States and to, and to expose its, its hypocrisy and double standards. And you know, the, last year we, we celebrated the, um, or, uh, the, uh, the 70th anniversary of that petition um, uh, or a couple of years ago. Uh, and we have, I've looked in, into the history, particularly through the amazing work of Carol Anderson and others. And what's interesting about that part of the work that they, they've been doing is that they, they really thought that this is for the NAACP, um, it's been around in, at the time, it was you know, for at least 50 years, uh, in the US was trying to, to create a new world order after World War II and uh, at least rhetorically championing human rights vis-a-vis -vis the former Soviet Union and has uh, made, made an effort through particularly the use of uh, the former first lady, Eleanor Roosevelt, of leading the effort at the international level. While really not thinking about what had that means or maybe thinking that we should uh, be doing that for the sake of humanity but not for the, what's happening in our backyard. So I think if you look at the way that NAACP used that moment and used uh, the documentation of racial discrimination, structural discrimination, racism in the country in that 96 page document um, that was filed to the United Nations when the United Nations didn't have even a, a division or any way of reviewing that kind of uh, a, a petition. But it was really to make the point of while you are preaching to the rest of the world, you, you know, you are ignoring what's happening here at home. And, and so I think that, that, that is uh, something that we build on. And, and in all the work that we do, we, we are trying to challenge that uh, power of, of the United States of, uh, of showing that we are uh, a, a champion of human rights. While if, you, if we really come down to in analyzing the United States record, uh, it was actually, most of it was uh, the denial of human rights, particularly in the, in the domestic context, and, and continues a lot, of other, a lot of examples to this day, uh, and even before the Trump administration. And I, and I purposely don't want to say, oh, we'll just be, because some people think that, oh, we have become a bad actor, um, you know, since Trump's election. And I think that really is a, a, a terrible mistake, and I think what we should use the moment of the Trump administration as an awakening of why, how did we get to this point and how do we use it in order to, and continue to use the double standards so that the United States first is, is, is serious about what, when, when it comes to human rights, what does that really mean? Articulate what does that mean in the context of domestic affairs and from there uh, it will be a better job for anyone who wants to do it internationally. So uh, th that, that's kind of the approach for for our, now, we, it, it's hard to sometimes, um, you know, the double standards, I think, argument is, is good for, uh, you know, obviously making it rhetorically, but also to try to push, push uh, uh, you know, administrations, and if you, particularly if you're, if you're interested in, in, in changing policies. But uh, at, I think at the grassroots level, I think that people, is this been a no-brainer? I mean, for the, maybe for, for a lot of people who work on human rights in, in, uh, in the area of changing policies, they either are focused on international human rights or they are focused on domestic uh, issues. There are very few that are really doing or looking and monitoring things that are happening simultaneously at the same time. Uh, so I think for, for grassroots organizing is a no-brainer. Um, the, the last thing I want to say about um, in the context of, of, I don't know if we want to get to it now or later, about uh, the context of policing and accountability, I think we, we have found also the double standards uh, argument very effective in, in holding the United States accountable, again, before the rest of the world when it comes to war crimes, uh, when it comes to uh, lack of accountability for torture, uh, for the lack of accountability for um, uh, things that the United States has, has uh, done overseas, not just in domestic violations of human rights. Uh, because then th that, I think, gives us um, 
uh, more clarity as a co and consistency and, and principles approach, particularly when it comes to uh, what is the answer to, um, to gross violations of international human rights. Uh, and so I, I do recognize that there is uh, this argument that we know, we'll be discussing more today of uh, you know, wh where do you put the legal, um, the resorting to accountability, what kind of accountability, how accountability would look like in the context of war crimes, for example. Uh, and I, I'm, I would love to talk more about that because I think that when, when we are thinking about uh, legal accountability it, it, in the human rights framework, it's really constrained to what the, the government is expected to do. So it doesn't even think about more societal, much broader thinking about the ramifications or the unintended consequences, which I think are, should be part of the conversation. But at some point, for us, it, at this point, of, of a, we, we just feel like this is not something that we can um, take off the, the list, given that the, the deterrence factor uh, has never been really realized because there was always an impunity. So the impunity factor uh, perpetuates, in a way, without the other issues addressed, perpetuates this kind of uh, resorting to pushing for more accountability and using the double standards in, in, in an effective way. Great, thank you. Um, Vasuki, you want to take us to the larger, you sort of had a segue there to the international criminal justice realm and talk about double sure. standards. Uh, sure, hi um, everyone, um, it's great to, great to come back here. Um, so I sort of plunge um, right in, I think. I, um, I suppose there are three things that I think that the double standard arguments do, and um, two, the, two things that I want to flag as sort of limits, limits, of that, um, limits of that argument. That's the next question. Okay, okay, that, I'll, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll leave the two, two points to, to later. So I'll, I'll just talk about three, three, three things that I think that double standard argument could do. So one is, I think, actually an abolitionist argument, and I would argue that that, is, that has been the trail approach to international criminal law has been an abolitionist one. There's never been a faith in international criminal law, and it has always been seen as a tool of hegemons who benefit from the current world order. So um, the double standard argument there is not to make law less hypocritical or law less, uh, less, uh, more, um, uh, more consistent. It has been a way of exposing, in fact, the mythologies of liberal legalism. It's been a way of exposing that the promise of international law's claim to universality is deeply problematic, deeply flawed, that, these, that it actually is a system, it is part of the logic of its injustice rather than something that's going to overcome injustice. So, so, what, so that I think has been, so there's all, always been, um, I think from Nuremberg to, um, to, um, to the ICC, there's always been deep skepticism from the Global South about uh, international criminal law and its promises, and if, it's, and if the double standards are invoked, it's invoked because it exposes uh, more than anything, it ex it, it's, an, it's a way to expose in some sense the, the horrors of um, the, the world order that we, where, that we live in. Um, which gets me to a second point, which is another work that the double order does, is in fact that kind of pedagogical work. Um, and in fact, when I was in my classes, if I, when I talk to students about ICC, the International Criminal Court referral, it has a provision which allows the Security Council to make referrals. The Security Council, where three of the five permanent members are themselves not party to the ICC, but nevertheless can make referrals and have made several referrals to, for a whole range of countries to be prosecuted by uh, the ICC from Libya to elsewhere. And, um, there's nothing like, you know, those kinds of inconsistencies, that kind of exposure of the rebel standards, quick is, 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 if you want like a magic pill for them to lose their faith in you know, international criminal law and develop their critical sensibilities, those kinds of things really do that very fast, right? Or um, say, uh, talking about the fact, uh, which I do in that article that um, uh, Karen mentioned, that for instance, the charter, the London charter that sets the, that, that um, set up the framework for the Nuremberg trials was passed in the very week um, in, uh, between Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So this 
charter that was supposed to be about setting up a court for the trial of war crimes, um, it, it comes uh, like a day after Hiroshima, two days before Nagasaki is bombed. So these kinds of things, so it has a pedagogical focus. I think also, I mean, another element of it, if I can now, I'm actually adding one more, a third, a third element of it which these expose is also, I think, a way, talking about these, it becomes a way for um, people in the global south, but people generally screwed by the international system generally, to express anger, right? The double standards argument has an affective value, I think, in, in saying, look, the system is, is really there, is, re is really a problematic, unjust system. And it becomes, a, and I think that's an important element also in international law and policy and discussions around that. So this becomes also a way to give expression to that. And perhaps the fourth thing I'd say, and that's uh, the last thing I'll say in this one discussion, is that, that I think the double standards argument allows us to make, and has been, as has been increasingly made, all the kinds of cross-national um, cross comparisons between countries that claim to be upholders of liberal legalism and their, in, and, and their uh, minorities inside. So the links that have been made between, uh, by Black Lives Matter and people are fo uh, focusing on Palestinian rights, people focusing now on the biggest, I think, detention system in the world that's being planned in Kashmir. Um, people who want to make those kinds of connections, say, between India claims to be the largest democracy, Israel claims to be the, biggest, the only democracy in the Middle East, and of course the United States, which claims to define democracy. Um, those, kinds of, those kinds of contradictions, parallels, I think also is valuable in the international law and policy realm about um, the work of Double Stadens argument. So, that's right. Great. Um, so, Kate, do you want to talk about double standards in the context of policing in the United States? Sure. Uh, thanks, Karen. Um, so, I think I'm going to talk about two kinds of double standards that I see uh, in um, when police are accused of crime or suspected of crime. Um, the first, I think, is reasonably clear, and I think it's um, important to point out. I've pointed out in my work, and I think if you are on Twitter or look at the media, it's getting pointed out all the time in, in various contexts. Um, one is that the police are treated better by our criminal legal system than ordinary civilian defendants. Um, we can see this in a variety of ways. Some interesting ones um, are um, something known as the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights, which um, gives police uh, special benefits when they're being interrogated. So uh, they can only be interrogated for a certain amount of time. They have to know uh, what they're being charged with. They can't be threatened. Uh, they can't be uh, made promises or, or given inducements. And these, uh, for anyone who knows anything about uh, interrogation in an ordinary context, are just part of the playbook when police are interrogating uh, civilians. Um, another way in which uh, I've written about the police being treated uh, very differently than uh, other civilians is just in the way prosecutors think very, very hard before they decide whether to indict a police officer or not. So ordinary citizen you know, rush the charges through the grand jury. Everyone knows the grand jury will indict a ham sandwich. That's the, um, get, get that indictment. Uh, with the police, they take a uh, long time, sometimes up to a year or even more, to think about whether to indict. They have independent experts come in and assess the situation. Um, and, and so people see these uh, sort of double standards or unfairnesses, um, and, and it's throughout the system, right, from uh, investigation to prosecution to jury bias to judicial bias to sentencing um, and uh, it's infuriating and I think that that makes a lot of sense and that that's not um, that, that that calling that out just as Vasuki was saying is, is not necessarily problematic um, but but what I see uh, what's surprising to me and it maybe it's a little bit more a hypocrisy than a a double standard is that um, it's sort of the groups who seem to, in most other contexts, abhor prisons um, and abhor long sentences, who are often the loudest in suggesting that the way we remedy these double standards are by increasing the harshness with, with which the criminal legal system treats the police, rather than thinking about, oh wait, isn't this maybe the way we want other citizens to be treated? Um, and using the police as an example for a more of a model criminal legal system. Um, as my own sort of feelings about the criminal legal system have sort of radicalized and moved towards abolition and away uh, from reform, uh, I, I've noticed this, this happen even more, and I just want to um, read a little bit from this letter. So the MacArthur Justice, MacArthur Justice Center uh, is a prominent clinic at, at Northwestern. Um, Jason Van Dyke is the police officer who killed Laquan McDonald. Um, a 
innocent teenager walking away from the police. Uh, he fired 16 shots. Um, and he was convicted. He sentenced to six years. The MacArthur Justice Center, um, which, um, so, which says a number of things about itself, uh, including um, that it uh, advocates uh, for getting rid of cash bail, for public defenders, for parole rev revocation, for juvenile defendants against solitary confinement, about prison conditions, about the death penalty, um, writes a letter on behalf of itself and numerous civil rights organizations arguing that, Laquan that the sentence for Van Dyke should be 18 years, not six years. They make a legal argument, boring. Um, but they also make, um, they also make uh, uh, this double standards argument. So they say, this is, here's the reason that, that he should get 18 years. Uh, because if Laquan McDonald, this is a quote, because if Laquan McDonald were to have been convicted of multiple counts of armed violence against a Chicago police officer, the court would have found no difficulty in imposing consecutive sentences that would have sent him to, sent him to the penitentiary for decades. Such extreme sentences are not uncommon. And um, they, they also say in this letter that they abhor as a general matter the pain that extremely long terms of imprisonment inflict on the black and brown defendants who are the ones typically sentenced to draconian prison terms under the sentencing scheme, the result of the false premise that such sentences deter crime or make our neighborhood safer. Um, so it's this kind of double standard or hypocr hypocrisy coming from sort of the most progressive uh, legal criminal legal minds among us uh, that have prompted me to start uh, thinking deeply about what, uh, what are we doing when we're prosecuting the police? What are we saying? Are we not just reifying our addiction to the criminal legal system, legitimizing a system that's been shown in so many other ways to be broken? Um, and I, I think it's an open question, and I would be thrilled to hear uh, responses. Um, but those are the sort of double standards that I'm thinking about in my work. Great, um, and I think you've each sort of started to push to a follow-up question, and maybe I'll start with Kate, just Great. since we're, um, you can continue the thread. But, um, so once you've called attention to double standards, um, it sounds like that's not fully convincing for you from reading that letter. Um, what, what do you think the next, what is the next step? Right, um, well I guess, so, uh, I think there's two perspectives in terms of the police. So there's a reformist perspective and then there's sort of an abolition perspective. The reformist perspective um, I, that would say, okay, sort of what I just said, what I, what I, a little bit what I was saying earlier, the police, get these, um, the police get these special protections when they're being interrogated. Actually, all the literature has shown that the protections that the police get um, are actually ones that will tend to help uh, folks, the most vulnerable, so young people, mentally ill, um, folks who are induced to confess, um, if we give them the protections that the police have, they are gonna be, we're gonna have fewer false confessions um, and uh, a fairer system of interrogation. Um, so one suggestion I've made is let's use the police interrogation um, protections as a model for how we should go forward with all interrogations. So that's sort of a reformist way to think about double standards, which is, sorry, I should say at the outset, this is the opposite, obviously, of what I see as the mainstream reaction, which is like, let's, let's throw the police in prison forever um, and um, because, because Laquan McDonald would be in prison. Um, and so I'm already saying, no, let's think about future Laquan McDonalds and, and how they're interrogated. Um, but I also think that, that, that the police present us with a really good uh, model for thinking about uh, abolitionist, uh, abolitionism, partially because the police are such a good example of uh, system, system corruption and system design and system problems being, being focused on you know, a few bad apples or rogue officers. And what you see, interestingly, is when, the, when someone's convicted, um, sometimes the police unions will uh, defend them, but sometimes, you'll certainly with sort of higher ups in the police department, you'll get them saying, well, this was a rogue officer. You know, this was just a bad apple, but look there, because everything here is still going okay. Um, and what we need is to, I mean, in my opinion, is significantly reduce policing um, and be thinking about how it's a systematically uh, corrupting um, power um, and, and not turn our eyes away from that uh, to look at the prosecution of these um, bad apples. So, so I think the, looking at the police and the way the criminal legal system treats the police and the way sort of, I, I, the word progressive doesn't feel right, but I'm just gonna use it, very progressive uh, criminal legal thinkers um, want the police to be treated harshly. Uh, I think it gives us a real window into our sort of addiction to criminal law 
uh, in this country. Um, and, you know, but also some sort of ways out. Um, great. Um, and, I, and I think, well, I, I'm actually going to read, um, that's a, it's a great segue in talking about bad apples, um, uh, and uh, to read something that Tanjiwi, um, she didn't write, but it's from a talk that she gave. So, um, and thanks to uh, students who did some research um, so that we could make sure and have some representation. Um, uh, well, actually, it, yeah, even when we were uh, starting to work with her and a lot of people were really excited about her coming. So I want to read this. So she says, um, the first issue is what I'll call the bad apple practice, um, which essentially narrows the problem to an individual as opposed to an actual institution that breeds individuals that carry out particular acts. So for example, and this echoes Kate, that was a bad police officer, as opposed to we have a problem with policing or with criminal justice in this country. Another one is the narrowing of the problem. So it's not just the criminal justice system, it's everything from housing to healthcare to food and the way in which the systems are in relationship to each other to create injustice. So what we're trying to do is not be confined to boxes in which, I think she maybe intentionally used that, not be confined to boxes in which policymakers try to find easy solutions to our problems. The solution is never going to be easy. It requires a deep study of the ways in which the institutions are harming our people and of whose interests it serves. Um, and I was reminded, um, Vasuki, you have uh, in, the, in that chapter, um, you actually say, yeah, we need to focus on bad structures, not bad apples. Um, and I wonder if you might um, now get to make the points you were going to make about <laughs> uh, maybe the limits of, uh, even though you gave very good justifications for the double standards <laughs> argument. Um, yeah, I mean, I think they actually clearly parallel what you just read from um, today's um, uh, speech that the, you know, so one, one is both that there is a way in which it focuses on sort of individual morality. There's a way in which it depoliticizes, right? So people think, oh, Bush was a bad guy, but Obama will redeem us. And then people are disappointed with drones or whatever. There, so there is that element of um, the way in which it focuses, it depoliticizes and um, um, focuses people on sort of individual morality as being the thing. And, you know, I mean, I'll be as breaking out the champagne as much as anyone else if, like, Henry Kissinger gets indicted or Netanyahu or any, or any of these characters. But, um, but at the same time, there's a, there's a cost to focusing your energies on that project. Um, and there's a political cost. And so the other element, which um, she also mentioned, is this question of narrowing. And I think if you focus on the structure, you, I mean, in international law, I think um, international criminal law plays a very different role, for instance, than in criminal law places, plays in the US. We don't have, in the international law, a mass incarceration system. Instead, the role that international criminal law plays is often to legitimize the system. So you can go and sort of bomb and plunder and whatever, and then you can set up Nuremberg, and it, um, uh, and it basically is, you know, it, it's, a, it's, an, uh, it's, a, it's often brought up as an, as an argument for how the international system um, you know, chose morality rather than retribution, or chose you know, forgiveness rather than whatever, or chose process, due process rather than um, something else. In a world where, of course, still the majority of the uh, of 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 uh, um, um, uh, no, not the majority, but a, a good, good uh, uh, almost half of the countries were still um, were still uh, colonized. Um, so it has a it, there's a way in which it, it has a legitimation function, um, which is different, I think, than mass incarceration function, but it has a nevertheless a system supporting function. Um, and then the other issue is that it distracts us, so that international criminal law systematically distract us, distracts us from all of the other things that are essential to making world order, in constructing the world order, the structural things around. So again, if I can on, uh, invoke a calendar, uh, a calendar coincidence, uh, that same fall where you know Nuremberg gets set up um, is also the same fall when the IMF and the World Bank get set up. So there's this whole institution building of the new world order, equally brutal, equally um, and has, has equally pernicious consequences. But we don't focus on that because I mean there's a in which Nuremberg legitimizes that moment uh, in, in terms of institution building for, 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 the, for international law. And I think that repeats again and again and again. So ICC, of course, comes 
in the, in, in the early 2000s, in the very moment, of course, where the current um, phase of neoliberalism and austerity and so on, and the Washington consensus gets for, forged um, in, in, in the very, very, very decade where people are debating about the Rome statue and all of these energies. I mean, in some sense, very concretely, that if progressive lawyers who would have otherwise gone, I think, to work on social justice projects, are they, get sucked into working, going, getting a job with ICC or working with, in the human rights field, the human rights field, which, as Jamil said, had much more radical and broader potential, if, you know, in, not perhaps in its dominant mode, but certainly in its sort of um, heterodox mode, um, people get sucked into focusing on international criminal law that that becomes sort of a narrowing even of human rights. And that's the one that gets all the money, that gets all the energy, that get that where donors are supporting work. There's a narrowing work that's there where people who could have been, in fact, otherwise um, focusing on international institutions and the economic order and making the links between um, the legitimation work that international criminal law could do and, um, and, international, um, and international political economy and so on. So. Great. Um, Jamil. Any, any, I know, because I think sometimes, I mean, you have used um, the double standards rhetorically quite effectively um, in calling for universal standards, but it sounds like there's sometimes when you're a little discouraged by the promise from that too. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, the, the reason where the limitation lies is that really um, when, when you're not able to, um, to go be looking beyond and see underlying you know, uh, root causes of that, uh, what causes the, 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 you know, the double standard or the hypocrisy and how do you address it, particularly in the imbalance of power within the different systems. So, you know, you talked about post-World War II, that, that was the victor's, you know, justice or, or the creation of that framework all was based on the fact that there are one party that had won and the other party was defeated and then there was a new kind of way of setting a new order I, I don't know how much, if, you, if there was really empirical study that would look how much uh, political capital and other resources spent on fighting impunity post-World War II vis-a-vis -vis the other uh, uh, you know, institutions like the World, you know, World Bank and uh, IMF. I, I think that there, maybe the ICC and uh, you know when there's a war crimes tribunal and and a genocide uh, uh, suspect is arrested or something like that, they get a they get a lot of you know headlines. I'm not sure I agree that there there was a lot and a, the, 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 that there was much more the resources or the cap, political capital that was spent equals the ones that was spent on trying to push back against some of the the other institutions that was post-World War II institutions. I, I don't know the answer to that. Maybe that's something to be seen in terms of, you know, even within the uh, human rights uh, uh, bodies now, there are p those who are challenging those institutions. Philip Alston in his recent report on the World Bank, uh, for example. And it, it, it's not like, you know, we're, but I agree with you that there is a sense that uh, we, 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 there's no, um, there should be questions and there should be some sort of uh, thinking about where is that going and what are, what are the causes that weaken um, the international criminal law system? I, I don't think that, and, and we also think what, what's, the, what's the alternative to that? Uh, are we saying that, the, oh, just because US is off the hook, we should not continue to press for accountability for war crimes? What does that mean for the next time that US com committed? And especially yesterday when Professor Gilmore was talking about uh, what's happening in the US around unions of guards uh, and vis-a-vis and -vis the other unions. I was thinking about the post-9-11 uh, world where we're living in, where there's so many people who are from the United States fighting wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere, and we have uh, uh, dozens of, of countries where the United States has military, some sort of military operations or military presence, exercise or what have you, and what are those people who come back and seeking jobs, where they end up? Uh, when, when Abu Ghraib happened, the torture in Abu Ghraib happened, uh, people didn't know what, what, what was going on. What is this prison, Abu Ghraib prison? And, if, oh, and when we submitted the first report to the UN Committee Against Torture, we, had, we, we made it clear that the abuses that we're seeing in Abu Ghraib prisons are not different from what we have been seeing for decades in the United States prisons and even uh, showing some evidence showing that some people who were former correctional uh, uh, 
uh, prison uh, management folks who went to Iraq to advise the U.S. government on building the Abu Ghraib prison. Uh, and, and we're involved in that. So, so there's a kind of a, a cycle that I think we need to address is not just in a one, I, I think that there, the, the issue of how much money we spend on looking at abuses, violations of human rights as a cause of war rather than the prevention of war. For example, something that there is an imbalance, particularly from the, in the human rights organization. Human rights organization, most of them don't take positions on war and peace. They say, well, Human Rights Watch will get in only when there's a, a, a war uh, I, obviously, there's an interest now in atrocities prevention and looking at, and there's more maybe resources towards you know inequalities, you know things like that are happening. But I, I think that there is that problem where we 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 tend to see the end of the, the the consequences of that rather than thinking about what what has led to that and what are the imbalance of power within international institutions within the current uh, actors, whether it's the United States. Um, and, and other actors. So I, I think that um, there is a limit to what, how much you can stress the double, double standard, particularly when, when you are not able to get that pushback, m making meaningful, uh, I think for the US, the only hope that we can do that, and I think it's happening, but it's not happening in strong connection, is the grassroots organizing that was really missing in all of the push for uh, universal human rights in the United States uh, in, in, a, in a very um, organized, uh, uh, systematic way. Uh, and I think the, the, the movement for black lives is offering that uh, by embracing the, the human rights framework uh, and, and by using the international mechanisms and, and, and using the messaging, even though they have not come to the point of, uh, of, of you know, going into the details. But I think that in of itself, and, and it's the, their, their emphasis on transnational solidarity uh, between different oppressed groups, as you said, you know, uh, uh, between uh, Palestinian uh, 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 freedom fighters and activists and, 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 and black activists fighting for justice in the United States, the Afro-Brazilian movement against police and other injustices, and, and you see there are a lot of those connections happening. I think that as a whole, uh, may have a potential to push back against this, the, the imbalance in power. Because right now, it is, it's kind of, there's an elite that is being, going into the system, you know, you see people who lose, particularly in the U.S. administrations. You, 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 you know, Democrats lose the, the White House, the executive branch, they, some people move out to all these other institutions, they come back when there's a new administration, and there's no shaking or, or really structural change in the way that we think about what, what, why is it that we are still uh, not, ma we're not making real progress in addressing this using, and because they all talk about double standards. I mean, you know, uh, even if you listen to Harold Coe, you know, he would, he would tell you, you know, we are for principles engagement, we're uh, leading by example and all of that. But then when it comes to being in their position in power, it seems that there's a, a different, some sort of a alignment with, with that, oh, that's, it's not going to work that easy when you are within the government to do that. And so what is that going to change? Uh, I, I think that will require much more. Um, and I think in, in that context, I mean, ACLU has been trying to be pushing for decriminalization, uh, looking not just on reforms in a very, I mean, obviously we would take wins when we can, but I think we are also more and more gradually thinking about more structural reforms. And even if you look at the last document, the visioning, the 2020 visioning, uh, the ACLU endorsed by, uh, the document was put forward by the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Uh, the principles there that talk about what are the thinking, you know, how do you change the legal uh, system? And even not using the word justice in the legal system, that's uh, not using legal, uh, uh, you know, criminal justice system, but a criminal legal system is a recognition that I think is, uh, and a shift in, in the way that people are thinking, and, uh, and, and, and a call for you know, how to divert resources from the criminal legal systems and over-incarceration and over-criminalization into more investment in communities, and uh, you know, whether it's education and other things, while at the same time having the, the other important conversation about reparations that is not uh, obviously disconnecting that. So I think that I would, be, I would say that the real challenge for us has been 
how do you really address the structural problems that have not been able to be dismantled? Uh, and we have been only putting out fires. And the question is, uh, is there a moment where human rights movement or human rights framework is able to really you be utilized in order to, to push for that, or it, it's already, as I said in the beginning of my remarks, it's already compromised in a way that it fits the system. So, you know, to be human rights compliant, that's something that prisons can do. Uh, you know, I worked on the revisions of the Nelson Mandela rules, not believing that, you know, we, we ought to, uh, that we have the, uh, that we are, we're, uh, we're going to, to have uh, something that would, would press for more prisons by, by doing that. But as I think one of the people who participated yesterday and asked Professor Gilmore about, well, what do we do to defend the dignity of those who are in prison? Or what do we do? There's a kind of a simultaneous thing that we keep doing. And I think that challenge, we have to put more resources in that bucket where there's more push for radical, more transformative change rather than putting out fires and the reform conversation is more limited to what is a low-hanging fruit in a particular administration or in a particular, uh, you know, uh, political um, uh, context. Um, great. I think it's nice that we have the clock up there. Um, so I want to be able to open this up for questions um, in a moment. So, um, but I'll I'll just end with actually kind of where you started, Jamil, in terms of my questions, um, which is when you asked, well, what what are we supposed to do? right, about accountability. Um, and uh, surely we don't think that the United States, for example, shouldn't be held accountable in all the ways that you've already discussed. Um, and I thought I'd start this round with, with Vasuki um, to see if you, we, we got the ACLU line, you can give us the TWAIL line. Um, <laughs> but um, what's the, what is TWAIL's take on accountability? Yeah, I mean, I think it is partly that um, so I like the way you spoke about the, the um, on, uh, Jamil about on the one hand um, the putting out fires and on the other hand the transform transformative interventions. And I think part of the trail line is that those that we can't think of those separately in some sense. And I think that that anything that we do in terms of accountability is we can't think of it as only putting out fires. It also has to be a step in the direction that we want to go in. Um, so, for instance, I th my my recollection, I, for instance, with Abu Ghraib, is that you know the U.S. Th there was a whole range of different kinds of interventions around Abu Ghraib. So, lots of progressives focused on um, getting those uh, prison guards accountable for Abu Ghraib even in a context where the whole intervention, the, military, the imperial military intervention into Iraq gets sanctified mm -hmm. because people are focusing on the injustices within Abu Ghraib as if that did not happen in a particular context. And so that, that is one dimension that, where in which that accountability gets narrowed in ways that are problematic, while I think, in fact, we can't think of that as, uh, you know, the war itself was a crime. We can't think of war crimes in that narrow. In that, narrow, uh, in that narrow sense. And then the second day, I remember people like Rumsfeld saying, oh, we are going to have a, we are going to have a, um, we are go we're going to see whether Jennifer England, if I remember right, right? Well, she was, uh, was the, yeah. where, where, where we're going to have that she's guilty, and then um, we, our system of holding her accountable is going to be like a, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a poster child for American law and uh, policy and democracy in the world. So there's a way in which all of that also, of course, gets utilized and, and, and assimilated, and, you know, we have no control over that into how that gets part of, part of, in some sense, the ornamentalizing of empire in a way that um, we may want to resist. So, um, so I guess I'm worried about going, um, going in, that, in, in that particular route. I mean, I think with Trail, I think the argument would be that it's not that you never use international criminal law, but that you use it when it's going to interrupt the system, when it's go not when it's not because you, it's, when it's going to reinscribe faith in the system. So for instance, I can imagine Trailers, and I'm sure there were Trailers who were involved with pushing for the ICC to look at um, Israel's responsibility with, uh, with Gaza, in 2014 or you know, bringing up the wall for, to the ICJ and so on. And I can see that as being valuable because we're never going to get justice on any of those issues. That's clearly obvious. So people are pushing for that, are pushing that to, as an interruption effort, as a way of showing the system um, with, uh, or, uh, uh, partly perhaps as a way of organizing and giving, um, a, and as a, as a way of solidarity building and partly as a way of exposing the, um, the, the um, 
um, the, you know, the, the, the emperor has no clothes in some sense. So right. I can see accountability efforts sometimes doing a social justice kind of work, like all of those people in Tahir Square who are saying, let's hold Mubarak uh, uh, so accountable, or people who are now going uh, on with great courage in um, the streets of Hong Kong. Um, it seems that those kinds of struggles have to be linked to our struggles around accountability, that we can't see those as that transformative struggle and the accountability struggle as being two different realms. We can only do things that are going to contribute to those social, I mean, so law always has to follow in some sense, social movements and those broader efforts too. So. Yeah, I, I will say, I think this is the only panel that's all lawyers. Uh, it's certainly the only round table. <laughs> um, and that was only because it's in JWE. Maybe I'll just ask Jamil to quickly respond um, and, and then let Kate uh, bring us, I wouldn't say back to the local because the Global is the local, but um, to to uh, to bring us back to sort of U.S. policing. Um, so, because I think you talked about this a little bit, but maybe you just want to have. Yeah, I, mean, I think that the just to go back to the, to the example of Iraq, and uh, you know, I think that there, I, I, the call for justice there is is I agree that it was not focused on the illegal illegality of the war. And for the same reason that I said, a lot of international organizations, including the ACLU, would not take a position on um, not the use of force, uh, the authorization of military force. That would be something that we would weigh in. But as a general matter of uh, you know, uh, engaging in war and, and what, what, what would uh, that entail and so forth, that's not something that you, where organizations are. There are some peace organizations that I, I think that they are not in terms of the their megaphones and in terms of the resources that they don't have the same as the ones that are now more in the international uh, organizations that are pushing for human rights, but they don't really weigh in on that. So I think you're right that there is a the question of you know that that kind of uh, 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 tension between you know where do you where do you focus on um, my, my I think our our effort was to, for example, not to look at the law, even though there was a suggestion, look, you know, the military actually did quite a lot of court-martial uh, trials for low-rank officers, both in Iraq and Afghanistan. The, our problem was that there was not, never uh, an accountability for the high level, both the political level and the military command responsibility for what happened to um, the creation of the system and policy of torture being and migrated from places to another, you know, from Afghanistan to Guantanamo and then from Guantanamo to Iraq. Uh, and then what that meant uh, for, for when you don't address that as do these, these leaders, you know, go and write their memoirs and they talk about it. We, you know, we approved waterboarding and nothing happens. That in it, in it I think there should be an answer to that. And I think that we can't just use the idea of interrupting a system without thinking maybe there should be a way that we can hold them accountable. And I think that, I'm not say, saying that the ICC will be necessarily the one that will help with the US. That will be very, very long shot. But I think the ICC is maybe, maybe in, in different contexts will mean different things, as you said, on, on Gaza and, and Palestinian rights. But I think that for the US, it's really a different game. It's a different game because of the way that, because of the the, the power of the United States and because of the history of that. So I think we need to really understand what is it that we can do, not just as an interrupting system, but we actually be able to, because otherwise, I think that the critique is what are you saying to the victims of, of those violations, of those abuses, particularly in the context of Palestine. There's a lot of critique. You, know? you can't really, you have to be very careful about what is it that you are, you are saying when you go internationally when you go to the ICC, when you call on the chief prosecutor to, do, to, to open full investigation. Uh, the, the, so I think there's that, all of that have to be uh, carefully um, um, considered, but I, I would not lose the hope of uh, in a particular time there would, and it's also about, you know, once the you know, United States there will be, now there is no counter, uh, but one that is more uh, accountable, more democratic, that is really, uh, pushed uh, by grass. So I think that if the Arab Spring have, you know, succeeded, it's just a final note, 
we would have a different conversation about accountability. Uh, if there was really a democratic uh, transition that have lasted, there would have been different kinds of accountability, not just for those particular states, like Egypt, but for also regionally, for how you then engage on these issues that would not look like you know you are, uh, you know you go after Bashir in Sudan and then you're not you're not doing anything to Netanyahu or that sort of thing. There would be a really a different and so. I agree with you, you follow the social movement, but that sort of also has to be given more advice on how do you do that so that you don't, you don't over, over promise and you don't go beyond expectations and, and realizing that there are, there are uh, limitations within the system. Okay, Kate, accountability. And I see you, you've been adding oh, thoughts. <laughs> no, well, just looking up the Movement for Black Lives platform. Um, so, well, I'm going to talk a little bit less about accountability, I think, and a little bit more about how, well, how I think we can harness the anger that uh, we all feel uh, at the violence committed by police to mostly people of color uh, and over police communities. Um, so uh, one important thing, I think, is that although if you sort of read news articles, you'll often see sort of these punitive instincts towards police being attributed to uh, Movement for Black Lives activists, if you look at the um, Movement for Black Lives platform, they say nothing about um, increased prosecutions, and in fact are harnessing the, uh, you know, the the visibility to uh, do what they to do things towards ending the war on black people. So they uh, are demanding an end to the criminalization and dehumanization of black youth, an end to capital punishment, an end to money bail, an end to the use of past criminal history for sentencing and housing, an end to the war on black immigrants, um, and mass surveillance, demilitarization of law enforcement, uh, privatization of police. So one thing to do is to harness these um, terrible moments to end the anger that, that ensues to um, make demands to uh, reduce uh, the use of the police and the criminal legal system uh, in, in, in all of our lives, but particularly in the lives of uh, over, over police communities, and to recognize that policing and and prosecution and incarceration and prisons are all wrapped up together. And the only way to stop the police violence is to reduce um, that system. Um, another, in this, uh, when Dr. Gilmore was talking uh, last evening, uh, made me think of this, and uh, my colleague Amna Akbar has written way more about this than I have, um, so I really can't speak too much to this, but I know that there are lots of uh, grassroots organizing movements um, coming up with alternatives to policing, so alternatives to calling the police, toolkits for folks who don't want to call the police. So there, there's a lot of um, important and interesting work being done um, on the ground uh, by folks who are not you know, as uh, addicted to needing of uh, legal solutions uh, to uh, uh, these problems. And again, I, I, I'm less interested in figuring out how to hold the bad apple guy accountable than I am in figuring out how to, uh, how to challenge the uh, system of policing and uh, of mass incarceration and our, as I'll say again, our addiction to the criminal legal system, which in my mind is what makes these terrible things happen uh, much more than an individual person uh, in, in a given situation. All right. Um. Let's thank our panel, and then we'll ask questions. Uh, and actually, I said panel, but again, it was a round table, and I want to thank you all for really engaging with each other um, and your interventions. So we have 11 minutes for questions, um, and we have people with microphones. So um, Kelly? Thank you so much for a very stimulating panel. Um, so I, I mean, I just want to reiterate, um, Kate, what Kate said at the end is that, in fact, when we're thinking about accountability politics and abolition, there is some really, really interesting work going on in movements right now about how to actually practice accountability that I think needs to be, I'm sad Tenjua isn't here because she probably would have been able to speak to that. Um, but I've always wanted to ask this question to lawyers because those of us that work from prisons and look at prisons, the abolitionist argument is so clear, it's so obvious, it's so, um, it's, it's, uh, I think it's probably easiest to make from, from the vantage of prisons. But from the vantage of, of the court, 
I'm wondering if you see any value, um, and I suppose, uh, Jamil, you were the one that articulated this most clearly, in thinking about the differential processes of the court um, in relationship to an abolitionist project. So, for example, the, the, the process of, of trial is not one thing, right? There is a, there is a process of evidence gathering, there is a process of, of witness making, there is a process of judgment, and there is a process of sentencing. And those are, none of those are, you know, they're, they're separate processes that happen in the context of a trial. So do you see any potential to move with an abolitionist argument and disarticulate some of those trajectories of a trial in building towards the kind of world that we want? Or do you think that all of those processes cannot be separated out from each other and amount to uh, the reproduction of incarceration? So in our search for accountability, is there any way that you can think about a judicial process that could aid us in the work towards abolition, or does that seem like it's out of the picture from the vantage of the courts? Um, that's a great question, and I think everybody has something I, I, I imagine to say about it. I'm thinking maybe we should just collect a few questions, um, and I saw a hand up here. Hi, thank you. I definitely appreciate this conversation about these difficult topics of the double standards. And one that comes to mind because it's been very present in the news the past week is um, also looking at how this works with sexual assault, uh, the Chanel Miller and Brock Turner case. And I'm wondering if um, the panel uh, can provide any insight on how we as uh, the advocacy community abolitionists could have done a better job of supporting um, Chanel, you know, supporting survivors and victims in these situations, but without the end result being a tough on crime solution that we've seen with this. Um, and also if there's anything in um, internationally that can point to some solutions for that issue. These easy questions being thrown your way. Um, <laughs> I see Fred in the back. So I had a question. I, I find the whole conversation really fascinating. I, I, I get the, uh, the, the, the point of a double standard debate, but I'm wondering if in the process of focusing on the problem with double standards, we're not reinforcing the sense that there is an implicit single standard uh, somewhere out there. Uh, and I'd like us to maybe think about that a little more. Uh, and uh, it occurs to me, when it comes to international criminal justice, that you know, some of us are advocating for multiple standards, that uh, there's a kind of tyranny of the uh, implicit single standard to the, uh, to the double standard uh, that distracts us from the possibility that we might want to evaluate different crimes different, committed by different countries or different types of actors differently uh, in ways that pluralize and uh, localize the administration of justice. So kind of letting a hundred flowers bloom rather than trying to see everything through a, a universalizing prism. All right, um, I think, um, so we have six minutes and I do wanna, I think I'm responsible for keeping us on time <laughs> for the rest of, so um, maybe, uh, I'll just let you each take two minutes to respond to whichever part of those questions you like. Um, Kate? Um, okay, I think I only feel able or to respond to the question about um, sexual assault. That sort of dovetails reasonably well with the work that I do on policing. Um, the first thing I have to say is um, uh, our friend and colleague, Aya Gruber's here. She has just written a book on uh, sort of incarceratory impulses uh, in the Me Too movement. So she's talking next. So I would say talk to her because she's going to have the best answer. Um, <laughs> and she but, has a chapter on the Brock Turner case. <laughs> and she has a chapter on the Brock Turner case. Um, but um, so, and, and I think it's a, but I think it's a really important question and I, I'm not probably going to have a satisfying answer to how do we support uh, survivors of sexual assault. One thing I'll say is I think the turn towards saying survivor rather than victim um, is important to take it out of the sort of uh, language of victim and offender uh, to, complicate, uh, to complicate the issue. Um, and just to say that that 
uh, is the that that experience, that whole thing from um, the way that you know that the defendant in that case was portrayed to uh, the recall um, of Judge Persky is exactly the way that uh, double standards end up uh, coming back and uh, punishing the um, sort of least. Uh, privileged among us, right? Because so we increase, we, we get rid of judges who do lenient sentencing, we increase uh, penalties for rape, we make up new crimes to do with sexual assault. Well, who gets arrested and uh, punished for those things? It's not the Brock Turners of the world, right? Those are not the people who will end up um, suffering. And um, and I think the, the, the victim or survivor question is extremely complex and we don't probably do enough um, you know, there's a lot of restorative justice stuff going on, and someone just won a MacArthur Genius Grant to, to do a lot of research on that, so maybe that's an angle. But I love the way you phrased the question. I, I, so I guess I said I could answer the question, I can't, but. <laughs> and I'll just add an advertisement for the round table this afternoon on abolition as daily practice. Um, and also there is a panel tomorrow on reckoning with violence. So okay. hopefully these will be, we'll continue the discussion throughout the next couple of days. Um, Jamil, two so, minutes. So uh, quickly, it's really hard. These are really good questions, and I wish we had more time to explore them. So one thing I would say on, on how international, I mean, internationally, international human rights framework, one of the things that really helps in this conversation is the push for alternatives to incarceration, to detention. And there's been a quiet a bit of movement in that direction, you know, looking at detention as a last resort, and not just in the context of children and child detention, which is what where there's much more, I think yesterday uh, somebody uh, mentioned that, as like, you know, uh, maybe the Dr. Gilmore uh, mentioned that, in the, in the sense of uh, we, we give to the innocent kids and children, and then from there, I mean, as if the other people don't have that right. Uh, uh, or, you know, that sort of, uh, so the, there's that push, not just in the context of, of, of children, but in a, a more broader sense. And I think that could be an opening to, to do that, but at the same time, um, there, um, it, it's still going to be within the other problems that I mentioned, which is that the, the whole framework, in a, in a way, is compromised and accommodated uh, a government. So there have to be the push for what happens at the national level. So you take the real ones that are guiding you, and I maybe I, that maybe responds to the, to the uh, question about this unitary or one standard. I think there is a way that you, know, you set in universal principles and standards, and you know, there's left to the national governments, so national level, local uh, uh, you know, um, context to fill in the details. And I think that process, if we do it right, with the help and support and led by social movements and organizing and that, that would lead to that sort of, that would be, oh, when we talk about this standard internationally, that's what is mean here and that helped and you show success and movement. And finally, I would say in the context of the role of courts, I think if you look at the abolition of the death penalty uh, or the movement for abolition, I mean, the courts have had, and, and now at the state level, have, is actually having more uh, role than uh, than the the federal courts in the sense that you have courts coming out and saying we think that the the death penalty in our state is a cruel, unusual, and, sh and unconstitutional under our state constitution and should be abolished. And if you look at the Massachusetts examples and the way that there was a back and forth, back and forth between the people in Massachusetts and the and the courts. Uh, where some uh, they made amendments to try to even strike down strike down the ability of the Supreme Court in Massachusetts to 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 declare the death penalty as unconstitutional, and yet that that ended up being uh, went to the really the right direction. And now people in Massachusetts are against the federal uh, death penalty for for uh, um, uh, sorry. Sorry, Yeah, for Zhenayev, in, in the case that is very hard politically to, to say, oh, well, he shouldn't get the death penalty. But the people there really went through that process that I think shows that the court should have a role, would have a role, if it has been pushed and, uh, again, by, 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 a lot of, by a lot of organizing. So that, that may be one way to, to do it and, and look at that in, in the sense that the court may have a role in, 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 uh, in setting or expanding in, in looking at issues of abolition in other contexts. But I think ultimately it will come down to the cost. The cost, I'm not just talking about the financial cost, 
Fiscal cost is obviously something that's been pushed by a lot of the reformists around cutting and ma you know, ending mass incarceration. But I think the cost to you know, uh, values, norms, society, uh, where, wh when it is really the cost outweighs what really you get out of uh, the death penalty or in this case, you know, prisons, then I think there would be more in the judiciary that would go along. I think right now there seems like, oh, well, you know, that's not, and then politically in some places, the courts are even, the judges are even elected by, by people. Uh, you know, there's sort of their, their, so the tough on crime brought also judges who say, we are, we're with you on that. So maybe there will be the other way around, even though that's a, you know, a question about how you, we, we pick and nominate and confirm judges and what will happen to their role in the future. Hey, Masuki. Okay, great. Uh, so I'll try to be fast, I'll go um, back to front, I think. Um, so Fred, um, yeah, no, I agree with you. There's both that, um, I mean, there's one of the things I, Remember saying when the double standard, the focus, uh, the limits of it in terms of focusing on criminal law rather than the structure as a whole and the focus of the structure on the whole will both speak to all of those problems around the promise of universalism as if there could be a monological approach to it or they could talk about justice only in the language of crime as opposed to all of these other kinds of ways of thinking about, um, think, thinking about justice and injustice as well. So it was, uh, so, so absolutely, and I think for, for that reason, I'm also, I do feel a certain allergy to the language of hypocrisy because of that, because I think hypocrisy does con convey a certain faith in, um, I mean, it also works to sort of depoliticize those kinds of choices and makes, makes it a question of, um, of, of, of morality, whether it's singular or multiple, but um, does, does, that, um, does that work? On the sexual assault stuff, yeah, I mean, I th think the, um, I mean, again, maybe going back I mean, it's sort of not delinked to the hypocrisy language, I think, about um, making these questions, making sexual violence a question of morality. I mean, my, the Me Too movements turned to carcerality, perhaps you know, already embedded, I mean, certainly in the international realm, with international feminist law, as um, Karen's uh, book is going to talk about, um, but um, has, been, um, has had been really pernicious. I mean, in domestically, clearly, by not thinking about, of course, the, ter the relationship between um, castrality around sexual violence and the history of lynching, the history of policing non-normative sexualities, all of those things. And of course, globally, similarly, in, um, in, in a whole range of ways in terms of uh, what it's distracting from, what it's narrowing, the questions it asks and the questions it doesn't ask, um, which is, um, I think, linked to the, last, the, the first question as well about how do we think of court processes? Um, I think we need to think about the role of court processes and even questions of due process not in terms of impunity, but in terms of the structure of impunity. So rather than focusing purely in terms of who is not being held accountable or who is being accountable problematically, what are the structures that enable particular lines of impunity to be audible and others inaudible? What are the things that courts do cover? What are the things it's actually sucking energy from and doing uh, otherwise? How, how are our languages around um, the relationship between due process and justice um, being so distorted? by um, the role of courts. So, All right, um, great beginning of the day. Um, thank you all. Uh, I just will say we're about to break into two rooms um, for the panels going forward. So now you have to make a choice and it's a very difficult one. Um, but the coffee, the breaks are all going to be right outside of this auditorium. And the rooms are a little bit so dispersed, but people will explain to you and maybe even walk groups of you to them out back. Um, and there's a map. So I'm not gonna try to do it, I'll just confuse you. Um, but just to say, keep coming back to this point with any questions, with the map, anything you're looking for. Um, we won't be back in this room until the final plenary.